Almighty God, we praise you for your servants, Columba, Aiden, and Bede, through whom you have called the Church to its task and renewed its life. Raise up in our own day teachers and prophets inspired by your Spirit, whose voices will give strength to your Church and proclaim the reality of your reign. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading for the day comes from the first chapter of Jeremiah, beginning with the fourth verse. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I was formed, you, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a youth. But the Lord said to me, do not say, I am only a youth, for to all to whom I send you, you shall go, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver, to deliver you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join me in reading responsibly uh, Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth is away, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea. Though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her. When morning dawns, the nations rage, the kingdoms are, he utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge.
If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise in his age, let him become a fool, that he may become wise. For the wisdom of the Lord is folly with God. For it is written, He catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. So let no one boast in man, for all things are yours, whether Paul, or Apollos, or Cephas, or the world, or life, or death, or the presence of or the present, or the future, all are yours, and you are Christ, and Christ is God's. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Towards the end of it, on 1164, 
No, not that. Excuse me. Okay. All right, 11.66. It says, the morning blessing. And Luther writes here, he says, in the morning, as soon as you get out of bed, you are to make the sign of the Holy Cross and say, God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, watch over me. Amen. And on the next page, there's something very similar under the evening blessing. So making the sign of the cross is a very important thing for us to do. And it's really for two purposes. One is to acknowledge the Trinity. Whenever we do make the sign of the cross, we are saying in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And the second thing that it does is that it's in the remembrance of our baptism. Last week, of course, we baptized Bailey Martin. And one of the things that I did just after I baptized her was I made the sign of the cross on her forehead and said, you are sealed with the cross of Christ forever. So whenever we make the sign of the cross on ourselves, we are remembering our own baptism and that we belong to Christ. Um, he was also asking about what is the proper way to do it, uh, to make the sign of the cross. Oh, okay. Um, so there are two, there are really two ways. There's, there's sort of the, the Roman Catholic way of doing it, and there's the Anglican way of doing it. And you'll see that Roman Catholics will, will cross themselves, and then they'll do the two shoulders and then stop. Doesn't matter which one you do first. Uh, in the Anglican way of making a sign of the cross, you, uh, you do up and down to the shoulders, and then back to the middle to your heart. And that's kind of the way that, that most of about what's exactly the right way of doing it. But just, uh, just uh, so, uh, that was just a question that, uh, that Virgil had, and I think some other people have wondered about that too. So making the sign of the cross at various times in the service, yeah. Um, you might as well, since you're on it, say why you do it on your forehead, lips, and heart before you do the cross of the Oh, well, yeah, that's just... Again, that's just a, a custom that, that when I, uh, I when you announce the gospel, um, then you make a little sign of the cross on your, so that God's word is in your mind, mm -hmm. on your lips, and in your heart. Okay. So, that's all for fun. Story time. We all like stories, right? Okay, I hope so. Once upon a time, there was an Irish nobleman. You might even call him a prince. He was a member of the family of a chieftain in the north of Ireland. And this particular nobleman was very well loved and was very intelligent. He became a monk and a priest. And what everyone knew about him was that he loved books. Now, we hunted high and low yesterday, but we couldn't find it. We knew we had a, uh, a ch children's book called Man Who Loved Books that, uh, that tells this story, but we just couldn't find it. So, uh, but of course, in his day, this is long, long ago, books were much harder to come by than they are now. You couldn't just order them from Amazon or even go to your local bookshop to pick one up. There were no printing presses. Every book had to be written out by hand. And the place where nearly all the books were written was in the monasteries. And that's one reason that this particular nobleman loved being a monk. He spent hour after hour carefully copying those books, writing them out in his expert script. And he loved to read them, too. He once said that he wanted to read every book in Ireland. I don't think he made it, but he never know. So when another certain monk, this other monk's name was Finian, came for a visit with a particularly beautiful book, which was a copy of the Gospels and the Psalms, our book-loving monk was enraptured. He knew the book wasn't his, but he came up with an idea. Now, if you or I heard that a certain monk was secretly getting up in the middle of the night, we might think 
he would be going to raid the fridge. Well, of course, they didn't have refrigerators either, but maybe raiding the larder. But not this monk. He got up night after night and secretly, with his little candle lit, began copying Finian's book of the Gospels into a new book. Well, he was so stealthy and such a good copyist, although he, he might have been a little sleepy during the day, that he just about got away with it. He was just finishing up his copy when he was caught. And then the sparks began to fly. Finian claimed that because this was a copy of his own book, he was entitled to it. But our monk, Columba by name, meaning the dove, claimed that because he had done all the work to copy it, he was the real owner. Well, it got uh, to such a state that they brought this case before the high king himself, King Dern who made a very famous and historical ruling. He declared, To every cow belongs her calf, therefore to every book belongs its copy. So the copy of the book belonged to Finian, not to Columba. And this was actually the very first copyright law in all of history, on which every copyright law ever since has been based. Well, Columba, the proud nobleman, didn't care much for this ruling. And he assembled an army and attacked the king and attacked Finian's people. And in the ensuing battle, 3,000 people died over this book. Columbus, Columba was victorious. So then, did he take back his beloved book? Well, no. He did not. Remember, he was a monk and a Christian priest, and he was so remorseful for what he had done and for the thousands of deaths that he had caused that he repented. He gave back the book, and he went into a self-imposed exile, taking twelve other monks with him. They sailed north to the Hebrides islands uh, west of Scotland. They stopped at one small island, but Columba could still see in the haze, he could still see Ireland there in the distance. And he had vowed that he would never set his eyes on Ireland again. So they sailed a little further until they came to the tiny island of Iona, just three miles long and a mile wide. And here Columbus settled and founded a new monastery with those twelve brothers who were with him. Right on the edge of that wild, unchristian land of those nasty Scots. Columba vowed that in penance he would save as many people as he had caused to be killed in his prideful war. So for the rest of, the li of his life he lived on Iona or traveled about over hill and glen preaching the gospel to those wild Scots, baptizing them and founding new monasteries. And in the 30 years that he was there, he did indeed bring far more than 3,000 Scots to faith in Jesus. Now, I have a little picture. There we go. This is uh, Iona Abbey. Of course, it was built a few hundred years, this particular building, a few hundred years after Columbus Day. And uh, it's now a retreat center, and you can see the nearby island of Mull in the background. Oh, and one more tidbit about Columbus' travels in Scotland. Once, when he was trekking through the highlands, he saw a wee beastie. Well, actually, it was a great beastie coming up out of one of the locks. And uh, he commanded it in the name of Jesus to go back into the lake, which it did. And that is the, uh, <clears throat> the first recorded sighting of the Loch Ness Monster. St. Columba. Well, eventually, Columba died on the island of Iona, 
1,427 years ago today, the 9th of June, and that's why we're celebrating his day today. Now, on a personal note, Coral and I have only visited Iona once, and it happened to me uh, 27 years ago in May, just before our anniversary. So we were on Iona really just a few days before the 1400th anniversary of, a, of Columbus' death, which was in the year 597. Okay, fast forward, 40, about 40 years later, one of Columbus' students on Iona, named Aidan, was invited by Oswald, the king of Northumberland, Northumbria, I'm sorry, uh, in the northern part of what is now England, where we lived for about a dozen years. And he invited, so Oswald invited Aidan to come and found a monastery there and to teach his people about Christianity. So Aidan, in the year 635, founded a monastery on another very tiny island, this time on the eastern coast of Britain, just south of Scotland, known as Lindisfarne. And uh, since this was it, it, right near where we were, we made many, many trips to Lindisfarne. I'm not going to say much about Aidan this morning, only to say that he was known for being very gentle with his people and not forcing them to live or to do things his way, but simply to love our Lord Jesus. So he took the gospel reading today very seriously, that those who want to be great among you must be your servants and serve one another. So, the next slide, next picture. Mission 
even before he was born, to go and proclaim God's word. And all three of our saints this morning each knew that they too had been called by God for a special mission. And especially Columba and Aiden were both called to go and proclaim the gospel. Columba, of course, took a very roundabout way of getting there. Was he called by God to start a war that would result in the death of 3,000 men? I don't think so. And neither did Columba. He knew that he had not just made a little mistake, but had sinned grievously in his pride and selfishness of wanting this book for himself. And of all things, a book of the Gospels that show us how we should not be selfish, proud, or harmful to others, but should act in a loving way. And yet God was able to use that terrible sin of Columbus and turn it to good. Columba repented and vowed to follow Christ unswervingly and to follow the direction of the Holy Spirit. And God blessed that willingness of Columbus to change his ways, live in penance, and do good for others. And because of his willingness to do this, Christianity was brought to Scotland and to Northern England for the first time. Remember what Paul wrote to the Corinthians this morning. No one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. But there's also grace. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. So it is clear when we read about Columba and Aden and Bede, that they were fully dedicated to that foundation stone, Jesus Christ. But Columba found that he was not building with gold or silver, and he wasn't even building with hay or straw. He was actually destroying the work that others had done. He had previously done good work, copying and preserving books for others to read and gain inspiration. But when he selfishly sought to keep that one precious book for himself, he destroyed all the work that he had been doing by destroying others in his war. And sometimes we find ourselves making terrible mistakes, doing the wrong thing, harming others. But take heart. Through God's grace, the situation was then reversed, and Columba then worked to build a most wonderful building, the church in Scotland and in Northumbria. So, how many of us have found ourselves doing what Columba had done? We begin with good intentions, but selfishness, greed, and sin do creep in. How difficult it often is to create something good and beautiful, but how easy it is to destroy. And yet the good news of the gospel, as lived out by Columba, is that God can, take, God can take the bad situations we make for ourselves and for others and cre can create something new and wonderful in their place. If we are only willing to listen to God, to accept His grace, to repent, to make Jesus Christ our sure foundation, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, to make something good and wonderful to the glory of God. Amen. So let us sing hymn 652, Built on a Rock.
come before the triune God to pray for our communities, ourselves, and our world. 
Dear God, you reawaken our hearts to your mercy. We give you thanks for renewers of the church in every age, especially Columba, Aidan, and B. Enliven the creativity and persistence of all seeking to transform the church into a closer vision of your beloved community. Merciful God, your presence is revealed in the shade of trees, the growth of seeds into flowers, and in the blessing of plants, granting food in their right season. Heal scarred lambs that they may bring forth abundant life. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Our nations and communities are divided, O oh God. Teach us again to listen with curiosity and mercy. Grant us the humility to work with others for the sake of the common good. Merciful God, receive our prayers. Hear the prayers of all who cry out to you from the depths of fear, despair, or hopelessness. Hopelessness. We pray especially for all those on our prayer list and those we name in our hearts. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Grant wisdom and clarity to all who are in times of discernment and transition. High school graduates preparing for first jobs or new educational journeys. Those who are shifting careers and those who are moving to new communities. Accompany them with your peace. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Praise to you for our ancestors in faith who believed, spoke, and lived in you, especially on the block. Give us confidence that as Jesus was raised, so we too will be raised with all the saints into your everlasting presence. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Receive our prayers, O God, and come quickly to our aid through the power of the Spirit and the love of Jesus Christ. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Hymn number 543, Go, my children, with my blessing. 